book of Matthew chapter 14. We're continuing our series labeled Layers Deep. And it's one of those series that ask probing questions. But I believe that at the end of this series, we'll be at a place of deliverance. We'll be at a place where we can shake some things off. Amen, somebody? But the reality is we got to be we got to be real with ourselves. Like if you're going to be free in anything, you have to be honest with yourself. Can you do that? Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. And it says immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was almost he was he was alone there. Verse 24. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying it is a ghost and they cried out for fear verse 27 but immediately jesus spoke to them saying be of good cheer it is i do not be afraid and peter answered him and said lord if it is you command me to come to you on the water let me come out there where you are verse 29 so he said come and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous or contrary, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him saying, truly, you are a son of God. I want to speak real quick from a subject title. Why are you afraid? Look at somebody and say, why are you afraid? Look at somebody else and say, why are you afraid? Oh, oh we, y'all going to make me work this morning. I'm telling you. Oh, this is the Starbucks generation, right? All right. This, is Starbucks not early? Open early? Okay. All right. Uh, They had an intern do it. I got it. They had an intern do your Starbucks and they didn't put the extra shot that you needed in there. Find somebody and say, why are you afraid? Find somebody else and say, why are you afraid? Yeah, I want to talk about, I want to talk about fear. I want to talk about fear. This word right here, fear, will be the difference this year, whether or not you succeed in your dreams whether or not you succeed in your goals, whether or not you succeed in all of your endeavors in life will be how do you handle fear? All right, let's get into it. Father, we thank you for the word. We don't know what's going to happen, God, but we know as long as you're in it, it's going to be great. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On your way down, say it to yourself. Why am I afraid? Now, I want to start by showing you guys a picture of, once again, an iceberg. An iceberg. And the purpose of this is to understand that there is more that usually happens beneath the surface of an iceberg. It's good to see you, Damien, and the family. There's more that happens beneath the surface of an iceberg than, than that happens above the surface. There's more that happens in the unseen part then that happens in the part that people can see. There's more layers to it. There's more happening in the realm that we can't see than in the realm that we actually can see. And if we'll be honest, see, there's more going on in our heads, in our souls, than there is than the face that we put out. Sometimes when we're smiling, it takes a lot to put that smile out because of so much going on in a world that people can't see. And as a result, what happens is we find a way in life as people to coexist with our issues. We know how to live with them, 
We know how to suppress them. We know how to put them in the back burner so we could get the job done. So we can just exist through life. We know how to coexist with our issues. But God did not create us to coexist with our issues. God created us to dominate our issues. God created us to live in such a way where we respond to our issues. We do not react to them. And so we have a lot of damage in our souls. When we sit back and think about our lives as people, there's things that happened to us when we were growing up. People we expected to be there. Friendships that we thought at this age we would still have. And we thought we would be at a certain point in life and we're not there. And some of us, we've had to reset life time and time and time again where we thought, okay, we, this is it. We're just going to do this. And, but we had to quickly stop and start over. And as a result, we have all of this damage in our soul. And if we're not careful, we can make decisions from a damaged soul. We can make decisions from a damaged soul, and the only thing that happens is it just causes more pain. And if we're not willing to look beneath the surface of the iceberg, put it back up real quick. If we're not willing to go deep and look beneath the surface, we will stay stuck in life. If we're not willing to go deep into our souls and dig and ask those questions, will never experience freedom in life. If we are not willing to look beneath the surface of our lives, we will not experience deliverance. See, a lot of times we get comfortable with being saved, but we never explore deliverance. So we get saved, thank God, we're going to heaven, but some of y'all going to live 80, 90 years. So what are we going to do in the meantime? Like heaven is later. What about now? We never explore deliverance. It's one of those things that seems like church has just abandoned deliverance. And so it's like, I just love Jesus. It's all good. But there's these things that I struggle with. I love Jesus, but why do I want to run my car into this guy on the road? Am I by myself? Right? I always say to my wife, if I had a truck with just bars on it, no license plate, no way to trace the VIN. I promise you I will ram this person off the road. I'm just being transparent. Can I be transparent? It's okay to laugh in church. See, we acknowledge, the problem is we acknowledge God. We acknowledge God as spirit. We acknowledge that we come from God and that we too are spirit, but yet we don't live our lives like that. We live our lives as though there is not this realm called the spirit realm. So we never talk about it. That's like spooky, weird spirits. That's, that's in the movies. But the reality of it is we are spirit. We possess a soul and we live in a body, but we never explore spiritual things. And so we are so conscious of this natural world that we can see, that we can touch, that we can taste, that we can hear. We're so sensitive to the physical world that we rarely pay attention to the spirit world that should be discerned. And here's what happened. There are things in this world, believe it or not, that you can't hear naturally, but you can hear them spiritually. There are things that you can't see naturally but you can see it spiritually there are things that you can't sense naturally but you can sense it spiritually because listen there are certain things that your natural perception will give you one information but spiritually you'll pick up something else for us, some people might say, you know, I just had a feeling, you know, that, that that deal wasn't right. I just had a feeling. I couldn't explain it on paper. The deal was good. The numbers lined up. I just had this feeling. I just couldn't go through with it. That's a spiritual inclination. Ladies, it's a, it, 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 we call it intuition. Men call it insecurity. When we get to relationship month, we'll find out which one of the two it is. Is it intuition or is it insecurity? I'll just park that right there. And so as a result, this week was a very challenging week for me 
today marks the day that I actually probably have more energy um, than all the other days combined. So last Sunday, wasn't feeling too good, pushed through it, and went home. By the evening, I was sick. I was ill. I was not feeling good. And fever started to come. By Monday, I was not moving at all. I was down the whole time. Josh kept coming up to me going, Daddy, are you well? I'm like, no, son, I'm not doing good, right? So we took Theraflu. I took Theraflu, and um, there's this oil in the islands. If I said it, y'all probably wouldn't know, but if y'all know what I'm talking about, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? So Emma rubbed me down with the oil and all that stuff. Not anointing oil, but, you know, the brown one. And so, so Tuesday, so I sweated out all Monday night. Tuesday, I woke up, I felt kind of energetic, and I was like, all right, man, I'm feeling good. 97.3 degrees temperature or whatever. Felt some energy, so I started going about my day. By the evening, I was up to 98, 99, 100, 101. Fever's back up again. Like, what's going on? So Tuesday night, take some Theraflu, take some medicine, go back to sleep, sweat it out, wake up Wednesday, sweating, wake up cool, all right, feels good. By Wednesday night, I went through the day normal with energy. By the night, fever's back. I'm like, okay, something's not, something's not right here. Like, I start off good, end up fever. And I heard the Holy Spirit says, okay, so you've maxed out your natural options. Are you going to engage spiritually? I said, you know, you're right. I'm not taking medicine tonight. I said, I'm not taking medicine tonight. So I took a shower, and I said, in the name of the blood of Jesus, and I prayed. I prayed, and I prayed. You know, it's the best I felt since then, right? And I said some specific stuff like, Lord, if there's anything that I may have done that have allowed the enemy to come into my life to sow sickness, I repent. Let that door be closed by the blood. Okay, y'all think it's crazy, right? There's people in the grave now that should still be here, but the enemy sown a sickness that the doctors say, oh, it's this. And they took medicine after medicine, but the reality is it was really unforgiveness. Because a lot of times unforgiveness can come into a person's life. They have bitterness, they hold it, and it turns into cancer physically. And so we're seeing that, oh, you know, they should have been there. But in reality, all they had to do is forgive and they would have returned back to health. See, we live in a spiritual world colliding with a natural world and if you don't have discernment you'll diagnose something for one thing and in reality it's something else and this is why you got to be able to look beneath the surface you got to be able to look beneath the surface see we are a tripart being that spends majority of the time living a dipart life you are spirit soul and body but we spend most of our time on our soul and on our body but we never take time to spend it on the spiritual side of us, yet we say God is spirit. Well, though that worship God, must worship him in what? Spirit and in truth. So you can't please God with your soul. You can't please God with your body. It's a spiritual experience. See, the unseen world controls and influences the seen world. What lies beneath in the unseen controls and influences our behaviors in the seen world. There's a lot of reasons and there's a lot of ways that we behave as people. And if we would take the moment to investigate, there are things beneath the surface of our lives, deep in our soul, real deep, influencing us to behave a certain way. We have these triggers, we have these episodes. When a certain thing happened, we think a certain way and we behave a certain way. When there's, when there's money, you feel good. When there's no money, you don't feel good. You panic. Why? There's triggers in your soul causing these behaviors. Until you succeed, you don't feel a value. Once you succeed, you feel a value. But if someone succeeds to a higher degree than you, you don't feel a value. These are triggers in your spirit. And you got to be careful because the enemy is pushing buttons. He's pushing buttons in your life. And so in Hosea, chapter 4 and 6, it says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. Proverbs 4 and 7 says, In all you're getting what? Get understanding. See, I want to let you know, what you don't know will, can, and is hurting you. 
What you don't know can hurt you. What you don't know is hurting you. What you don't know will hurt you. And so I want to talk about fear. I want to talk about fear because fear entered this world when Adam sinned. It was, it was packaged with sin. When Adam sinned and disobeyed God, fear came in. Listen to this. In Genesis 3, verse 9, it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Verse 10. So he says, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you was naked? Have you eaten of, from the tree which I command you that you should not eat? So in other words, God is saying, it's not in your nature to be afraid. What you doing afraid? If you came from me, you shouldn't be afraid about anything unless you step outside of who you truly are. Now you're afraid. Think about that for a second. There is nothing that you should be afraid of. But when we're not where we're supposed to be, then we'll be afraid. I did some research. There's about six things that most humans are afraid of. Number one is poverty. Let the church say amen. Do you know what it's like not to have any means? Oh, my goodness. Poverty is one of the biggest fears. People are afraid to be broke. No, actually, broke is not poverty. Broke is just being temporarily separated from your income. That's broke. You know, there, it comes, but it doesn't stay, right? Poverty means it, it, it's not coming, right? But the bills still come. Then number two is criticism. People fear criticism. They fear rejection. People fear bad health. People feel loss of love or not having love at all. That's one of our fears. People fear old age. They fear the future. They fear change. And then, of course, people fear death, right? See, those fears usually drive us to extremes that end up in sin if we're not careful. So we got to make sure how we manage our fears because those things we fear can drive us to the extreme. Watch this. Fear of poverty drives people to steal. Fear of criticism causes people to throw shade. For my older people, throwing shade means hating and gossip, backbiting. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm talking about to the older people on this, on this record, listening <laughs> on YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff. Fear of not finding love causes people to compromise for any love. I'm so afraid of being by myself, I'll take anybody. I'm so afraid of not having money, I'm going to take everybody else's money. <laughs> right? Fear of old age causes people to take pills and supplements that eventually turns into addictions. Fear of death causes people to conclude that there is no God and life is only right here, right now. Why? Because in reality, you're really afraid of something you don't know. You're afraid of something you don't have, so you make your own conclusion with it. Now, let's talk about fear. There are two types of fear mentioned in the Bible. The first one is beneficial for us. The second one is detrimental to us. The first one is the fear of the Lord. And the fear of the Lord is this. It's a reverence for God. It's, it's, it's a respect for God. It's a total acknowledgement of who God is. God, See, God wants you to be to fear him but not be afraid of him. Respect him. Understand that the breath you're breathing, he allowed you to have it. I know I'm young, but I got an old soul. The reality is, look, you could be here today and gone tomorrow. There's people that was here with us that didn't cross over in 2018. Why? If we're here, it's by the grace of God. And so every day you wake up, don't take that for granted like he owe it to you. I was like, Lord, thank you for this day that you've given me. I'm going to make the most of today. I don't know about tomorrow. I got plans for tomorrow, but I don't know if I will see tomorrow. See, that's letting him know, hey, I understand you the man. That's how that works, right? But then there's the spirit of fear, which is a, the one that is, brings uh, uh, timidity, fearfulness. 
That's the spirit of fear, right? And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So the first thing we have to understand is fear is a spirit. It's not an emotion. When you're, oh, I was afraid. That's not an emotion. It's a spirit. So it's not something that you manage. It's not something that you counsel. It's not something that you go to your shrink and you talk about. It's something that you cast out. Fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit. And you have to understand. So when you're dealing with fear, you're dealing with something that is alive. That's very important because because fear, the spirit of fear wants to completely control you it wants to completely control you right its primary focus is to intimidate and ultimately imprison you so that you do not pursue purpose and that you do not accomplish destiny that's how serious fear is now dealing with fear is tricky because fear doesn't look like fear fear tends to camouflage itself so that we don't call it fear, right? It dresses itself up. So let's go ahead and call it, let's go ahead and expose fear. Some of the things that we don't think is fear is really rooted in fear. Number one, this one's a real big one. This is the spirit of fear, procrastination. That's really rooted in the spirit of fear, procrastination. Number two, making excuses is really fear. In operation we make excuses for everything we don't take ownership that's really fear you're afraid of being responsible so you make excuses why are you late again to work well you know the thing no you you're afraid of taking responsibility so you make excuses number three overthinking that's really fear some of y'all overthink too much. What if, what if, what if, what if, what if it don't work? Well, what if you overthink too much, but you're really afraid? So you, to, you mask your fear with thinking, but you're really afraid. Overthinking. Number four, over planning to the point of no action. All right, so if it goes this way, we'll do it this way. But then again, if it goes this way, first I want to have my own movie and then record in my own time, but then I want to start in my own video. <laughs> Shout out to coming to America. <laughs> Over planning is really fear because you have no intentions of doing anything anyway, but you want to let us, you, wanna, you want to let us know that you're working on something. But in reality, you're really afraid. You're really afraid. Yeah, you know, I'm working it together first. I got to get the I got to get the cards and I got to get the business cards and then I got to get the contract. I'm like, are you going to get any clients? <laughs> That's really fear. That's really fear. And you have to call it out. What are you waiting for? Here's another one. Accepting defeat based on the facts and not the truth. That's fear where you go. Oh, they're not. The bank's not going to approve me. The school's not going to let me in. There's no reason for me to try that. Why? You're looking at facts and you're coming to a conclusion. But the reality of it is if God told you to do it, you could do it. But you're looking at facts, which means you're afraid. So you, you're bringing all these facts out. Yeah, you know, I was going to do it, but this is why I can't do it. Oh, you're afraid. We need to start changing our dialogues with people because we bail people out too much. Well, why don't you do it? Well, you know, I was thinking about maybe next year. Oh, you're afraid. Well, I really, oh, you're afraid. Because you said you was going to do it this year. Now you're putting it off to next year, which means you're procrastinating, which means you're afraid because you assume you have time that you really don't have. So you're putting it off, which is actually one of my things. Hesitation. Hesitation is a form of fear. Hesitating, pump faking, never jump in. You're scared. There's a saying back in the day to say, if you scared, say you scared. <laughs> and then, then, then do it anyway. But the, you're scared. You know what? I'm scared. I don't know what I'm scared. I'm scared. That's why I'm hesitating. I should have stepped out and did it, but I'm scared. What are you scared about? 
Most of us are hesitating because we're scared. And so we got it on paper, it's in our head, we plan it, and we never do anything. You're scared. You're scared. Next one, deferment. You're putting things off to a later time. I'll get to it. That's fear. You're deferring. That's fear. I'm, I know I'm in your business. I know. But you're going to get free this year. Why? Because I know what it's like. Thank God someone stepped out and go, I got this idea that a person can pick up a device and hit some numbers and call someone from the other side. Why? Because back in the days, people got on horses, people got on buggies, and have to cross over the country to deliver a message. And sometimes the message didn't make it, right? But thank God that people stepped out and go, I'm going to step out and try this thing and, and, and see if it works. Thank God people say, I'm going to try this thing called a business, and if it grows, I'll give these people called employees a job that they can provide for. Thank God that people weren't scared to try something new because we're the benefits of it. You're wearing somebody's shoes. You're wearing somebody's clothes. Why? They was not scared to try something new. I wonder what you would do if you weren't scared to try something new. And the reason sometimes I get really frustrated because we're locked into the same generation and I feel like you're holding out on me. Like I'm stuck with you in your generation and you don't want to deliver anything that we can benefit from. So another generation is going to benefit from something that we could have enjoyed together. Can you imagine the generation of the guy who had the idea of the AC, but he wouldn't do it? So the whole generation was hot because he don't want to create it. And it seems funny, but someone is dying of cancer because someone don't want to get back to school because they have the idea for cancer in their head. Someone's dying of the simplest disease because someone want to be lazy. They're deferring it. They're putting it off to a different day. But the idea, the solution is in them. That's how serious it is. When I see you guys, you're, you're not just people. You're carrying ideas and solutions that are supposed to be in the world, but you're deferring it. You're scared. You're scared. And so we have to suffer because you don't want to let it out. What are you afraid of? So what if it fails? At least you got it out. At least you got it out. Doubt is the last one. See, in Matthew chapter 14, we see an interesting battle going on. We see the spirit realm and the natural realm colliding. We see fear and faith contending for one host, which is Peter. And our lives is just like that. Every day, faith and fear tries to fight to see who will win in our lives because it can't occupy at the same time. So either faith occupies and we move forward with God's agenda or fear sets in and we move forward with Satan's agenda. So every day there's this tension that we go through and you feel it like I should be doing that. I really got to do that. It's like, oh, man, like, all right, I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. I'll get around to it. And there's this fight. And then one day you see someone, you get motivated, and then faith takes over. And then you get down there to the aisle, you file the paperwork, you do it. And then one day, and then fear takes over. We go, I don't have no money. I really want to get these shoes. I really want to get this outfit. I know I should spend it on the business. And there's this tension of faith and fear. Faith and fear. Faith and fear. And that's our life. Faith and fear. And so Peter is in this environment, he says to Jesus, tell me to come, I'll come. He steps out and he starts walking out on the water. And he starts doing something brand new. See, what happens is it's normal to feel fear as you approach something new. As you approach something new, it's normal to feel fear. But as the newness wears off, it's abnormal if the fear still remains. See, you're approaching something new. You don't know what you're about to get into yourself. So you feel a little apprehension. You're like, oh, I don't know, but okay, I'm going to step out anyway. But after you kind of get things settled, if the fear is still there, we got a problem. That's not normal. See, being scared is a reaction of the flesh. It's a reaction of the flesh. But faith is our truest expression of God's nature. If you want to see what it looks like, let me give you some notes. 
See, that's why Peter didn't sink. Check this out. Peter tapped into a realm where he no longer was subject to the laws that govern the earth. He was no longer subject to gravity. Why? Because he was walking by faith. And that's what happened. When you walk by faith, things that shouldn't happen or we think should happen to you naturally doesn't happen because you're trusting God and you're walking by faith. And so in order to make those natural things happen, I have to pull Peter out of the spiritual realm into a natural realm. I know what I'll do. I'll make him sensitive again to his natural senses. When he saw the wind, he got scared and he began to sink again. There are certain things we step out and we start doing. We don't know where the money's going to come from. And so we say, we're going to trust God. We're going to step out on faith. And you start trusting God. You start walking out on faith. And then they send you the first bill. And you get scared. And you start sinking. Why? Because you stepped out of faith. Now you're like, okay, where am I going to pay the money? You stepped out in faith. Stay out in faith. You stepped out in faith. And so write this down. Fear pulls you into the flesh so you can react. Faith pushes you into the spirit so you can respond. I'll say it one more time. Fear pulls you into the flesh. Whenever you're dealing with fear, it's always something dealing with the flesh. So you can react. But faith, faith pushes you in the spirit so you can respond. See, the flesh is an easy target. It's solid, it's heavy, and it's easy to aggravate. That's why the Bible tells you, walk in the spirit. Why? Because when you walk in the spirit, people can't offend you. People talk about you, throw shade on social media. God bless you. They're in the flesh. But when you're in the flesh... Oh, flesh be Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, for real? All right. Let me go ahead and throw some shade back. Let me go ahead and get petty, too. Why? Because that's a flesh. That's immaturity. Maturity means let me walk in an elevated perspective. Now, let me give you these real quick. There are two operations of fear. This is going to bless you. There's two operations of fear. The first one is there is internal fear. And there is external fear. We're talking about fear. So you have to identify what kind of fear am I dealing with? Is it an internal fear or is it external fear? Because sometimes the thing is so complex, we just take it all. In. You need to be able to break it down and go, okay, I'm dealing with fear. Is it inside of me or is it outside of me? Now, if it's internal fear, internal fear withholds. Okay? So you know what you're feeling. If what you're feeling is something is holding me back, it's controlling me, it's containing me, it's preventing me from stepping out, that's an internal fear. You with me so far? If it's an external fear, external fear withstands. Something is confronting me, something is combating me, something is trying to prevent me from moving forward. You see how that works? There's that internal. So in this story here, we see Peter on the water dealing with an external fear. Why? He already stepped out. The wind don't want him to get to Jesus. And then we see the disciples dealing with the internal fear. They didn't even get off the boat. So something made them go, no, nah, I'm just going to stay right here. Nah, I'm... Anybody been on the cruise ship? You see how dark that water is? No, nah, I'm straight. Like, uh... I hope Peter make it. (laughs) If he don't, I'll tell his story, right? Once again, we just say that, but we're really scared. Now, I'll just stay back here, and then I'll testify for you. So so both of them, at different times in our life, there's going to be fears that withholds us back. It makes us hesitate. We have all of the experience. We have all of the relationships, the resources, but something causes us to hesitate. That's an internal fear. And then there's times where there is no internal fear. You start doing it, and now there's external fear in the form of a banker that go, nah, you can't get that loan. In the form of the teacher or the university say, no, you can't. So it's an external fear. Why? The reason that's important is because you need to know how to pray. <clears throat> is it internal or is it external? You need to know how to pray. So fear, write this down, exploits areas of exclusion 
Fear exploits areas of exclusion. I want to help you this year deal with fear. Fear exploits areas of, of exclusion. What do I mean? Fear usually occupies areas and environments in our lives that God is excluded and uninvited in. It exploits those areas. We can tell the areas you don't trust God because that's the ones you're afraid of and that you have fear in. I know people don't trust God financially because that's what they are scared. Their actions prove it. Oh, you don't trust God in that. Because your decisions prove that he's uninvited in it. You see what I'm saying? And then there's, there's, there's people who don't trust God in their relationships. So he's not invited in that, and that's why they're afraid, and they're taking on the load themselves. You're carrying something that you don't have the expertise to carry. You can always tell the areas people don't trust God in because that's the areas that they're afraid of and that you see the most sporadic decisions in. Here's another thing to write down. Fear reveals the areas in our lives where we may be lacking faith and trust in God. See, fear will always look for the door to enter into our lives. That door is usually the place where we lack faith in God. As I begin to close, because of sin, we are all vulnerable to fear. So don't think that I'm not subject to it as well. Because of sin, everyone in here is subject to fear. Because shame, judgment, condemnation, punishment, and torment all comes from fear. And so there are things we don't even try or go after because we don't even feel like we're qualified for it. Now, we disqualify ourselves because of shame. But understand, God's desire is that you get to that place of completion. You get to that place of wholeness, restoration. Whatever it is that God shows you, God wants you to get to it. If you feel like you don't deserve it, that's not God. Because God wants to complete what he starts in you. So how do I move forward, preacher? Let me give you three things. Three things to take away to move forward. First thing is God's presence and love eliminates uncertainty. You got to get in God's presence. Why? John chapter 4 verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all shame, casts out all judgment, casts out all condemnation, casts out all punishment, casts out all torment. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not made perfect, been made perfect in love. You haven't matured in the love of God. See, making decisions influenced by fear reveals to me that I have areas in my life that I have not yet made available to God to reach. When I make decisions out of fear, it tells me right there, I haven't let God in in this area here. So I quickly move. I quickly jump out of a situation. Why? Because I did not even let God give me his perspective in it. Number two, external inputs will either feed or starve your internal phobias. So what am I saying? Your, 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 your social media, your, your TV shows, those types of things are what you take in are either feeding what you're afraid of or they're starving it. See, I wanna encourage you to feed your faith, starve your fears. Faith grows from the word of God. Fear grows from ignorance. Fear grows from ignorance. See, growing your faith will automatically starve your fears. Growing your fears will automatically starve your faith. Number three, this one's very important. Pursue opportunities to gain new experiences in God. See, fear is causing some people to live a very boring life. Some of us are living extremely boring lives. Like, I mean, like, your life's boring. Why? Because you won't try anything new. Like, you just... 
you're okay with the Mr. Rogers schedule. It's boring. You won't get any new friends because you like the old ones you got. You won't learn anything or try anything new because you're stuck to your process. That's boring. It's boring. And so I want to encourage you, pursue new opportunities because in those pursuits, you gain new experiences. And in the new experiences, your faith grows, your knowledge increase, and your confidence in God grows with it. See, it's our experiences that gives us our confidence. We go through life with God and we can look back to go, man, I shouldn't be here, but I'm still here by the grace of God. Your faith is at a higher level because of those experiences. But if you never made those experiences with God, how can you truly make statements like I trust him? So when you step out into something that's uncertain and realize, oh, it didn't kill me. You just gain ground against the war of fear. And you step like, so if yesterday it may have been that line that fear controlled and you say, you know what? I'm going to step out one more square to see what's beyond this square. God, you with me? Yeah, I'm with you. All right, let's go, God one step closer you're advancing and before you know it your entire life is a life of faith there's no areas for fear to dominate that's how that works see Peter's faith grew because he pursued opportunities to gain new experience by being obedient to Jesus and what Jesus was instructing him he knew God's love for him would not lead him astray one more time as i close my question to you is what are you afraid of what are you afraid of there's things that you have in your heart that you want to do and you need to do but for whatever reason you're not doing it and chances are something has you scared and you have to identify it so that you can conquer it so that you can move forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that what lies beneath the surface this year will not stay there. God, this year we will investigate. God, we don't have all of the money. We don't have all of the relationship. We don't have the associations. But you know what, God? We got you. And that's enough. And so since we have you, we're going to step out this year and do some crazy things. And if we fail, we fail trusting you. But you know what, God? Your word says you never fail. So we're going to be surprised to the experience that we did not fail either. God, let that be the prayer. I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice that may be afraid of something. That fear is is, is controlling them fear of not having enough money fear of the relationship not 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 going the way they think it would go fear uh, 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 of not knowing what tomorrow bring God I pray that you may bring peace in that area now in the name of Jesus and let them enjoy the fact that they are in you that they are in you that they are in you in Jesus name Come on, put your hands together for the word. Come on, one more time. Put your hands together for the word.